For a decade, Margaret Thatcher's grip on the British political scene was absolute. At the height of her power, we thought she was brilliant. She took the party by storm and redefined conservatism as Thatcherism. Like so many other young hopefuls, I entered politics because she had inspired me. Margaret Thatcher was an original, a true modernizer, a role model. Her power over the party didn't evaporate when she was dumped as leader. In four subsequent leadership elections, she nominated the winning candidate, and one by one they fell. Even now, with David Cameron's determination to change the party, he must make his reforms with reference to her. Some reforms contrast with Thatcherism, and some update it. When he's ahead in the polls, the party gives him a free reign. When he falls behind, some Tories grow fractious and accuse him of betraying Margaret Thatcher's blessed legacy. After I was chucked out of Parliament in 1997, I had to recognise how heartily the public now despised us, despised me. I believed that the Conservatives had to be changed, modernised, to reflect the fundamental changes in Britain's social attitudes. Endlessly harking back to the glory days of Margaret Thatcher would take us in the wrong direction, to the past, not the future. Until very recently, I wondered whether the Tories could ever win again. To understand the long shadow cast by the giant figure of Margaret Thatcher, I've debated with former Tory colleagues, including some like me who've aspired to lead the party. Three of them actually succeeded where I failed. Ken Clark has held most of the great offices of state and has stood for the leadership as a moderate many times without success. <laughs> well, I think the Conservative Party's problems really stem from the fall of Margaret Thatcher and the circumstances. Uh, yes, I mean, if I was doing an academic thesis, I would say that's what destroyed the equilibrium of the party. Of course, the disputes became about other things. And I trust that Mrs Thatcher's government... As a schoolboy, William Haig hero-worshipped Margaret Thatcher. She repaid the compliment by endorsing him as leader. He lost the 2001 election and resigned. There were the adverts, you know, of me with Margaret Thatcher's hairstyle, of them saying, really, the Tories haven't changed, they are still the Thatcherites. Uh, and I suppose the net effect of that was damaging to us. Veteran Tory minister Michael Howard led the party into the 2005 election on a solid Thatcherite agenda. He failed and subsequently resigned. I didn't think that, that I was the best person to convince the country that the Conservative Party has changed. Real change isn't just... David Cameron came from behind to take the leadership of the party after its third electoral defeat and believes that he could be the modern-day equivalent of Margaret Thatcher. When some people who are very close to Margaret Thatcher criticise me, I always say, well, look at Margaret Thatcher. She was the future. She said to Britain at the end of the 70s, you know, our best days are not behind us. I understand the future. I was brought up talking politics. My father was a political refugee from Spain, and both he and my mother supported Labour. I had a poster of Harold Wilson on my bedroom wall, and at the age of 11 was helping Labour to get elected. My conversion to conservatism began at university. Labour in the middle 1970s looked clapped out to me, dominated by trade unions, riddled with militancy. Margaret Thatcher, by contrast, was modern and cutting edge, offering a new economics and a new politics. I joined the Conservative Research Department. In the 1979 election, I was given the job of briefing her before the morning press conferences by giving her all the bad news from the media. Her reaction was generally somewhere between explosive and thermonuclear. Over the years, she put trust in me, promoting me repeatedly. Unwittingly, I'd become her protege. So I was already a seasoned cheerleader for Thatcherism when I was selected to defend Enfield Southgate in 1984, 
where the sitting MP had been murdered by the IRA in the Brighton bomb. I hereby declare that Michael Denzil Xavier Portillo has been duly elected to serve as member for the Enfield Southgate constituency. By the time I got into Parliament, I'd been out drumming up support for Margaret Thatcher for 10 years. She did everything at the gala. There was never any time to lose in the race to implement the Thatcher revolution. Because a dream starts and a dream stands. John Whittingdale was Margaret Thatcher's political secretary when she was forced from office. But back in the 70s, he worked like me to get her to number 10. I was helping out at the Cambridge by-election in 1976, so she was quite newly the leader of the opposition. We were waiting for her to arrive to visit the by-election in a, a, a very foggy car park just outside Cambridge. Uh, and there was this roar of engines as three cars swept into the car park and all the doors opened simultaneously and she jumped out of the car at seven in the morning and said, take me to the battle. <laughs> And, and then when we did take her to the battle, I mean, she ran up and down every street in Cambridge that we took her to. Mm. Uh, I was working for the Conservative Research Department in the winter of discontent. Um, part of my job was sort of collecting stories about all the horrors taking around the place around the country. And there was a feeling that the whole country was falling apart and that she was going to come riding to the rescue. And, of course, she charged in and rolled up her sleeves and got on with the job. At the same time, she was creating a brilliant image for herself which became iconic around the world. The conviction politician going full steam ahead to save the country. No wonder we were smitten. That's great. That's beautiful. To those waiting with bated breath for that favorite media catchphrase, the U-turn, I have only one thing to say. You turn if you want to. <laughs> The ladies not for turning. <laughs> Mrs Thatcher was a very untypical conservative. Um, she probably couldn't have happened any time other than the time she became Prime Minister. There was a specific set of problems that uh, had to be addressed, very high inflation, industrial chaos, economic stagnation. There was a real fear that the country was going down the tubes, to use the vernacular expression. And I think the public were ready to accept someone who had rather harsh rhetoric, who had radical policies to offer. David Mellor was Margaret Thatcher's youngest cabinet member. He argued with her, not least over the way that she divided the party into wets and dries, those who were signed up for her revolution and those who were ambivalent. There were lots of, lots of things about Mrs Thatcher that I found irksome at the time and still do. But the truth of the matter is that most thinking people in this country realise that Britain was a near basket case when she was elected in 1979 and the reforms of the 1980s, which I was proud to play a minor, a minor part in, have fundamentally changed this country and indeed fundamentally changed the political debate. The Labour Party is a quite different entity from what it was then. I mean, politics was, was completely changed by Margaret Thatcher. Not all to the good, to the good of the country, not to the good of the Conservative Party, in my opinion. And why not to the good of the Conservative Party? Because I think there was a them and us mentality that I always rather reacted against, you know, the wets and the dries, whereas quite a lot of us, you know, I don't know, was I a wet, was I a dry, I probably teetered in between, I'm probably drier now and wetter then, but it seems somewhat unnecessary to have this them and us thing, particularly when some of the us's were not always the people that, um, you know, she should have relied on as much as she did. We should back the workers and not the shirkers. Mrs Thatcher knew clearly who her enemies were and how to deal with them, whether it was the trade unions or the Soviet Union. The Russians said that I was an iron lady. Uh, they were right. <laughs> she was a dragon slayer and she revelled in that reputation. Britain needs an iron lady. It strikes me that one of the things that characterised Margaret Thatcher was that it was easier to understand what she was against than what she was for. Do you think that's been one of the problems that the Conservative Party has had ever since, that her dragons are all dead? 
I think partly that. Also, I think, um, I mean, it was quite a heroic age. She, had, she did slay those dragons. It was incredibly brave to do so. Um, and I think one of the problems for the Conservative Party is not only admiring her bravery, which is absolutely right, but also we now look back and think it was an absolutely straight line and she never compromised and she never had to duck and weave a little bit, which you, you do in politics. But I think, you know, politicians of my age and the Conservative Party were all influenced by Margaret Thatcher because of the, you know, politics was definitely in her age about getting things done, about your convictions, about trying to change your country for the better, and that definitely inspired me. And we don't want politics to just be boring and managerial. It was anything but when I entered Parliament. Mrs Thatcher's huge ambition to shake the socialism out of Britain was exhilarating. And what's more, her best years were yet to come. There was, even then, a new generation, captivated and inspired by Thatcherism. Ed Vasey, then still at school, is now a shadow minister. I thought of myself very much as a Thatcherite. Uh, as a teenager, 15, 16, I led a kind of weird double life of being an ardent Thatcherite conservative, but doing the normal things that teenagers do, including going to lots of gigs. I remember at the time, this is an incredibly embarrassing story, but I think it shows how committed I was. There was a band that I used to adore called The Beat, and they used to have a song called Stand Down Margaret. I said, I see no joy, I see only sunshine, I see no chance of your bright new tomorrow, so stand down Margaret, stand down, please, stand down. And I couldn't work out what they had against Princess Margaret, because I just couldn't believe that anyone would want Margaret to stand down. I thought she was fantastic, Prime Minister. She polarised opinion in the party, the government and the country. There was never a majority of Thatcherites even in the cabinet, especially in the early days. Coffee and then they want us all out. Uh, I just, can I just explain, in case you should think anything different, the people I've got coming have no particular great significance, all those who are not here. Angus, hello, in you go. Any particular? I'll bring you all out in a moment. Like coming out of the bloody <laughs> zoo. <laughs> she had superficially a rather frenetic style of managing colleagues and managing government and managing opposition. But actually, she was much more calculating, and I don't mean that in a devious way. She was much more cautious than that in action. In 1987, Mrs Thatcher led us back to power in a stunning third election victory. Thatcherism was riding high, but she seemed restless, as though in need of new targets for the Thatcherite onslaught. No one must slack. <laughs> we can have a party tonight. You can have a party tonight. You will have a marvellous party tonight. And you can clear up tomorrow, but on Monday, you know, we've got a big job to do in some of those inner cities. A really big job. Our policies were geared education and housing. She felt she had to announce a new mission. There had to be a, new, a renewal of her purpose. Um, having had eight years of dealing with the great dragons. And so she decided the inner cities was going to be one of the great challenges she had to deal with. And although she was right, I think this is when the Conservative Party began to slightly lose a sense of what its raison d'etre was. Can I start the meeting by asking... I think one of the mistakes that some ultra-Thatcherites made was believing that you could have radicalism forever, permanent revolution. I don't think the public would ever have accepted that. And I think there's always been this argument between those who wanted radicalism forever and those who wanted to go back to a more traditional Conservative Party. Yes, I'm coming round again and down, down and up and round about. She summoned me to number 10 to give me my first ministerial job. She said, I'm sending you to Social Security, which was my very first job in government too. Then she tried to remember some of the tiny details of the work. 
but soon petered out. Years in number 10 had wiped out her memory of her ancient briefs. There was talk that her best days were now behind her, that she was being difficult, refusing to listen. Little clouds of doubt were appearing in our Thatcherite sky. I thought she was slightly losing the plot compared with her great days. Towards the end of the 80s, because she'd been in so long, she was slightly indulging uh, herself in, uh, you know, the, the weaker aspects of her personality. She, she'd lost patience with some of her key colleagues. Uh, she thought she could do everything. And I remember one of the low points, I thought, of the cabinet. Uh, it was when she gazed around the table. You may have been there by then. I pressure you were. Well, I was in the cabinet. The cabinet. Uh, she gazed around the table after some row about something comparatively minor, business of the House of Commons, like, and she suddenly sort of slapped her hands and said, why do I have to do everything in this government? And I thought at the time, why doesn't anybody have the nerve to tell her that the trouble is she thinks she can do everything? And, and that was at the heart of it. I thought Mrs Thatcher had run her course. I just think, you know, she'd lived in the fast lane for so long. I think that one of her strengths was always that um, she was intolerant of opinions with which she did not agree. But I think that intolerance grew to the point where almost any other opinion, even if it was a sensible one, could not be, um, uh, you know, could not be countenanced. I also think she'd run out of real dragons to slay, so she was looking for creatures and pretending they were dragons. The creature she picked on, bizarrely enough, was the rate system, and her solution was the poll tax. Friends tried to talk her out of it. None of us can understand how someone with such a sure touch could have got it so wrong. Uh, do you remember how significant that seemed at yes, first? It was all... I could see a horrible thing unfolding, actually. Across the country tonight, dozens of councils are trying to agree the level of what is now pretty well universally accepted as the most unpopular new tax for years. She had committed herself to getting rid of the rates because um, she felt on the side of hard-pressed ratepayers. I'm not saying I'm being very wise after the event, but I did keep asking the wretched Department of the Environment, how much will people have to pay? They kept giving me percentage figures, and I said, women who have never had a bill in their lives, never received a gas bill, a water bill, electricity bill, are suddenly going to be faced with a poll tax bill, a community charge bill. What will this be? They could never tell me. the fundamental error that she made, and uh, I remember referring to it at the time, it didn't do me a lot of good actually, was that the community charge was the biggest domestic political mistake since the Second uh, World War. You know, how could a, a leader who was wise make 13 million people pay a tax they'd never paid before? You know? It just showed that she was no longer thinking in a, a rational way. Um, uh, and was really looking to create controversies where it was unnecessary. The mounting crisis over the poll tax was clear as rioting broke out in London and people refused to pay. My job now was somehow to reassure MPs, but many could see that they were going to lose their seats. Nothing is more dangerous than a panicking backbencher. Even the most overtly loyal of us were worried. You know, when the Prime Minister offers you a hot potato, there is only one thing to be said. Take responsibility for the community charge, Prime Minister. There's nothing in the whole world I would rather do. <laughs> but the funny thing is that I meant it. At one time, you were responsible for the poll tax. At another time, I was responsible for the poll <laughs> tax. Did you ever foresee that this issue of local government finance could play a huge part in bringing down a Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher? No, I didn't think that. I could see problems ahead. Um, you know, the, the great, th great thing about the poll tax is that so many people were involved in it at so many stages that um, um, it's easy for us all to slip out of accountability. <laughs> Um, but we all... well, and, and that was one of the problems at the time, that it nobody was, was accountable. That, that's right. I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, my job was to take the legislation through um, the House of Commons. 
um, which I did. Um, it was like most of the things we were concerned with. It had its advantages, it had its disadvantages. I could see that it might lead to problems. Um, I didn't think it would lead to the downfall of Margaret Thatcher, no. The poll tax also, of course, illustrated what was wrong about her relationships with colleagues, because she'd never driven a policy through like that before, by only talking to people who would agree with her and do what she said. Uh, it, contrary to popular belief, she had been quite collegiate and collective uh, for most of her time, and she was now cutting corners in a way she'd never come before. Mrs Thatcher wasn't listening and so she didn't realise how dangerous for her this crisis had become. We had a succession of meetings with backbenchers uh, on roughly weekly basis, which was intended to allow the parliamentary party to express their views to her. Unfortunately, uh, more often it was the reverse. She expressed her views to them, um, and I'm not sure actually it helped greatly. <laughs> she thought the opponents of her radical policies were pathetic and feeble, and sometimes they were. Um, but she had decided that she um, was right. It just happened step by step, and of course, she drove it through against opposition in the cabinet through sheer force of personality and determination. Her feel, her judgment, which had been brilliant, she had a perfect feel for what the British public felt and the tremendous courageous instincts for doing what she felt was right had gone a bit and she was flying by the seat of her pants and her judgment was no longer as good as it had been. Mrs Thatcher then declared war on a second front. As though she were not already in sufficient danger, she turned her guns on Europe, opening huge divisions in the party. As a committed Eurosceptic, I was, of course, on her side, but others in the government began to line up against her. I think rightly she began to realise that this handing over power to the European Union was inexorable, was going on stage by stage. Again, she was a fighter. She liked fighting wars, she liked having battles, she liked taking people on, and she quite enjoyed some of the battles. She'd, she'd got the rebate back in the early days, so she was... Her approach to Europe was confrontational rather than cooperative. I applauded Mrs Thatcher's speech in Bruges, which made clear her hostility to the ambitions of the European Union. We have not successfully rolled back the frontiers of the state in Britain only to see them reimposed at a European level, with a European superstate exercising a new dominance from Brussels. Mrs Thatcher was utterly opposed to closer European integration, but she faced huge pressure from other leaders and from her most senior ministers to join the exchange rate mechanism, which locked sterling into a fixed relationship to the continental currencies. I remember she took me aside and said we must never, ever join the ERM. Never, never, never. Absolutely clear. But Sir Geoffrey Howe, the Foreign Secretary, and her Chancellor, Nigel Lawson, somehow defeated her, and she agreed in principle to British membership. She um, was prevailed upon at a European summit in Madrid to agree to a formula that we would enter the exchange rate mechanism when the time was right. And I think that was as a result of the great uh, persuasive efforts at the time of Nigel Lawson and Geoffrey Howe. Um, she thought, I imagine, that the, the, the escape clause was when the time is right. And uh, I, I imagine she probably thought the time never would be right. Soon afterwards, she took her revenge by demoting Sir Geoffrey Howe to Deputy Prime Minister and she picked the almost unknown John Major to replace him. She didn't dare sack Nigel Lawson, but he was already linking the pound to the German mark. In response, she began running her own competing economic policy from number 10. Lawson quit. Losing a chancellor is generally a sign of a government falling apart. 
Nigel Lawson had always previously been regarded as one of her closest allies. Um, in the early years of her government, when she was under attack from the left, Nigel Lawson was one of the Thatcherite stormtroopers, and for him to fall out with her and to resign from her government, I think, made it all the more serious. John Major then replaced Lawson as Chancellor. Why she put so much trust in someone untried was puzzling, but loyalists like me still accepted that somehow she must know best. Good morning, what would you like me to do? The Rome summit in autumn 1990 would prove Margaret Thatcher's last defiant stand. We, her foot soldiers in the battle for British sovereignty, cheered when she renounced all diplomatic niceties and savaged the whole idea of a united Europe. I remember when Mrs. Thatcher came back from the summit in Rome where she had uh, refused to agree to the Euro, or thought she had refused to agree to the Euro, and announced to the House of Commons no to the Euro, no to political union, no to a super state. No, yeah. no, yeah. no. Yeah. Everybody was appalled. I wasn't actually appalled, I was uh, firmly on her side. But everybody today thinks the Conservative Party has been a Eurosceptic party, atavistically opposed to the Euro and European integration since time began. That was not the case. The government was now in a state of civil war. Sir Geoffrey chose his moment to quit. Henpecked for years, he took his revenge quietly as ever, but with lethal effect. I no longer believe it possible to resolve that conflict from within this government. That is why I have resigned. In doing so, I have done what I believe to be right for my party and my country. The time has come for others to consider their own response to the tragic conflict of loyalties with which I have myself wrestled for perhaps too long. Michael Heseltine challenges Mrs Thatcher for the leadership of the Conservative Party. I am persuaded that I now have a better prospect than Mrs Thatcher of leading the Conservatives to a fourth electoral victory and persuading the ultimate calamity of a Labour government. There had been a challenge to Mrs Thatcher in 1989 by Sir Anthony Mayer. He was dismissed as a stalking horse, one who prepares the way for a more serious opponent. Her easy victory over him led to complacency in the Thatcher camp. Michael Heseltine was, of course, a formidable foe, but they didn't see that he represented mortal danger. They forgot, I think, that she had her own electors, called the members of parliament. And because the prime minister of the day, especially a long established one, is treated with respect and deference and has great authority from the power that they have. And so they didn't really respond to the MPs. They were rather dismissive of them, I think, thinking they were rather inferior beings. I remember um, more than once telephoning uh, and saying, is there anything I can do to help? Being told, all under control, don't worry, you know, thank you very much. Uh, I, I had the same experience. I, I assumed I was working in a cell and that my cell of people was connected in some way to lots of other cells. And at the end, I, I felt there was no campaign at all. Indeed, with 400 electors, more or less, members of parliament, I, I had the impression at the end that she hadn't spoken to a single one of them. It was terrible. Uh, now, well, I wasn't even given the privilege of working in a cell, <laughs> despite, <laughs> or thinking I was working in a cell, despite my, my repeated um, offers of help. I couldn't understand why Mrs Thatcher had been left in such a humiliating position. Sadly, historians may attach much of the blame to her parliamentary private secretary. 
I was sitting opposite Peter Morrison, who was the PPS in charge of the campaign, um, and he was constantly reassuring me and indeed everybody else uh, that the support was there, that there were a few malcontents, but that she would win easily. Now, I had a number of friends in the parliamentary party uh, on the right in the No Turning Back group who were her key supporters, and they were coming to me and saying, look, it really is bad. Um, people who you, we've always previously thought of as being loyal are saying that they're not going to support her. Indeed, I can remember Peter Morrison leaving for Paris, tapping his pocket and saying, I've got the figures here. I don't want to sound complacent, but I think it'll be good. His figures bore, I'm afraid, no relation to the outcome whatsoever. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. Mr. Sanchez, can I ask you to comment? It's here. This is the microphone. Naturally, I'm very pleased that I got more than half the parliamentary party and disappointed that it's not quite enough to win on the first ballot. She came within four of having a victory on the first ballot this evening. I'm sorry she didn't quite make it, but she's got many more than the next candidate. She seems to me very well placed to win in the second ballot. That's what she will do. Stop! Have a time! Prime Minister returns on the Wednesday and she invites the cabinet to come and see her one by one. Um, you went to see her? Yes, it was one of the most awful moments in my life. And I said to her that if she wanted to continue, I would support her. Um, and that no one outside this room would know what I told her. But that my personal view was that uh, she would be defeated in the next round by Michael Heseltine. And I strongly felt that it was in her interest that she accepted that and resigned now. It was an extremely painful interview. I had voted for her on the first round. Um, I'd argued for her uh, in the first round. Um, I thought that even if she won on the second round, she'd be so damaged, her authority would be so undermined that it would be very difficult and humiliating for her to go on. Probably the most, uh, or one of perhaps the most emotional interview uh, discussion that I've ever taken part in. I was very concerned that she would lose heavily on a second ballot and be humiliated. And I said, that's the one thing I don't want to happen to you. Um, so my advice to you is based on that judgment. But if you decide to fight, if you decide to, to, to carry on, I will, I will fight with you in the last ditch. A group of us, hearing of the growing defeatism amongst her cabinet, rushed in to see her in her Commons office. I may well have elbowed Morrison aside though I didn't actually punch him, as was later reported. I told her that she could go on, that she should speak to her MPs and ask for their support. She was taken aback. It had never occurred to her to fight for her job. Ken Clark, on the other hand, was pretty blunt about her prospects. I was not choking about the tears. I mean, I just thought... I, I was actually... And I probably was, we were both quite rumbustuous. I was beginning to get a mounting sense of anger that nobody would face up to reality. I thought this was getting frankly farcical. And I, I, I had got it stuck into my head uh, that she, it was over and we'd got to move on. And this, this appalling situation, I mean, the government was in a terrible mess with a prime minister in office whom the parliamentary party were trying to throw out in full public gaze. And that the sooner she and her entourage accepted the reality and we moved on and got a, a new leader in place by a process that did the minimum amount of further damage to the party, the better. If you'd been in the House of Commons then, would you have voted for her? Yes. Uh, I'm a great believer in loyalty to your leader, not just because I'm now leader of the party, so I'd like that from others, but you know, I just think politics is a team game. You owe loyalty to the captain of your team. She had been elected in 1987 um, you know, with a huge majority, and the Tory MP should have supported her. Up until the last moment, a hard core of us tried to persuade her not to quit. But by now, the cabinet and most backbenchers saw her as an electoral liability, and she recognised it was over.
I had a meeting with her in the early part of the evening, maybe about uh, seven o'clock, and uh, it was pretty clear to me she'd decided then. And then I should think more like uh, 11 p.m. or something, I was walking past my house comms off office and I noticed the telephone was ringing. I picked it up and it was you. It was. And you said, get here at once. And I went flying around to Downing Street. It was by then very late at night. Uh, and people have since said that we were trying to persuade her not to, not to resign. That's not right. By then she'd decided. And all the discussion was how to stop the other Michael again, Michael Heseltine. I think she felt that um, the damage she had been, uh, that she had sustained as a result of that first ballot was so great that actually her survival, she'd have been wounded very badly and it wouldn't have been in, in the interests of the party. Mrs Thatcher's years of power are over. She resigns to make way for a Conservative leader more likely to win the next election. This brings to an end a quite remarkable premiership. She has made a remarkable contribution to Britain's history and has led this country with great distinction in the 1980s. Will she tell us whether she intends to continue her own personal fight against a single currency and an independent central bank when she leaves office? No, she's going to be the governor. On the present structure, <laughs> order the Prime Minister. What a good idea! <laughs> I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> I think I was in tears. I think lots of people around me were in tears. Um, one member of parliament suddenly yelled out, take your resignation back, which was a very kind of choking moment for the rest of us. But you, but you did have the sense that the Conservative Party suddenly woke up to what it had done. Um, it got rid of a leader who'd won three general elections. I, uh, I remember at the time, some people say this was going to be a great, terrible moment for the Conservative Party, that it would have great repercussions and waves long after the event. And at the time, I didn't quite believe that. I think it did. I think the way she was overthrown has, did the Conservative Party huge damage because of the way the party reacted to it. And uh, I think it went, the damage went way into the 21st century. I went to Mrs Thatcher's last lunch in Downing Street. As we left, we lined up to shake the Prime Minister's hand, choking back the tears. Someone gave her a small gift from a constituent, and that finished us off completely. We're leaving Downing Street for the last time after 11 and a half wonderful years, and we're very happy. I was gutted. I mean, I've never seen so many grown men with tears in their eyes. Um, I mean, I was, I am, and I ever will be utterly devoted to her. She was the salvation of the nation. Thank you very much. Goodbye. She was very, very upset. I mean, she felt that she had been elected Prime Minister and it wasn't for, you know, a, a 400 Conservative MPs to uh, overturn that. Um, and she was inevitably uh, bitter about it. And I think a large number of her supporters felt the same. The brutal removal of Mrs Thatcher as a sitting Prime Minister sent shockwaves through the party. And the repercussions are even now still apparent. Her supporters couldn't forgive those who'd voted against her, and unity was shattered for years to come. I now think that it was a disaster for the Conservative Party to remove her in office rather than for the electorate to remove her. I think she'd lost the benefit of the doubt to a considerable extent, so I don't think we would have won. But removing her, while it might have ensured that we won the next election, I think left a real poison in the Conservative Party.
Well, I think the Conservative Party's problems really stem from the fall of Margaret Thatcher and the circumstances. You do? Uh, yes. I mean, if I was doing an academic thesis, I would say that's what destroyed the equilibrium of the party. Of course, the disputes became about other things. But we, we never came to terms. That the wound was quite a, with, with that. The wound was dreadful. It caused, it caused bitterness on all sides. Margaret Thatcher instructed me to back John Major, the candidate who would carry her banner forward. He won a clear victory, though none of us quite knew what we were getting. It's an enormous encouragement to know that so many people in the parliamentary party are prepared to trust me with the leadership of the Conservative Party, and I will endeavour to discharge those responsibilities to the best of my ability. Nigel Lawson who'd been John Major's boss, then told me that he was incapable of making decisions. You might have warned me, I said. If she'd been too dogmatic, perhaps he would be too indecisive. Oh, can't anybody see? Oh, right at the beginning, um, there, were, there was a lot of hope and excitement. Bonhomie. Well, more than Bonhomie, I and mean, there was Bonhomie, of course, and, and he's famous for that, but there was more than that because it was a fresh start. Uh, we've got a Prime Minister who's going to appeal to a lot of people that Margaret Thatcher could never have appealed to, so there was a lot of hope and, uh, and excitement. Thus far, it seems to go well. Are there any other further comments on community business? John was extremely inclusive, if you remember. I mean, everything was frightfully collective, almost to an excessive degree now. It's very difficult to get to a conclusion. John would allow us to talk and talk and talk until the last sort of doubter had come on side. Oh, yes, of course. Right. I don't think I quite knew what he wanted to achieve, uh, apart from factuism with a human face, I suppose, is what he was trying to do. Um, but therein lies the contradiction. The sign that Mrs Thatcher now doubted whether she'd picked the right successor came when she announced she'd be a good backseat driver in Major's rearview mirror. I think it started a process where John was always looking over his shoulder and I, I, I mean, if someone said to me, why did John Major really get it wrong? I think it was because he could never quite believe he was prime minister. And therefore, um, it was almost like he had to look over his shoulder for consent to do things. I, I remember in the very early days, like, uh, maybe about six weeks into John Major's premiership, I was sitting next to him on the front bench and Margaret Thatcher appeared on the back benches. And he said to me, um, you know, how do you think the prime minister is coping? And I said, ah, Prime Minister, I said, even you apparently have difficulty remembering that she's not Prime Minister and that you are. I wasn't yet in the Cabinet. I was in the engine room, not on the bridge. And from that vantage point, it was clear to me that the motor was shut down and we were drifting. I think uh, working with the Thatcher government, government ran itself by traffic lights. And with Mrs Thatcher, there were some very, very clear green lights, which is full steam ahead. There were a lot of red lights, don't even try. And there were just a few amber lights, which is, I'm prepared to think about it and discuss it once. And I think with the major government, the poor civil servants saw these red and green flashing lights and got very confused. John Major believed in compromise and political manoeuvre, but we lacked a set of principles and a game plan. I think John Major has never been given the credit for one of his greatest achievements, which is that the Conservative Party is still in existence and in one piece. And it is perfectly true that he achieved that by giving what might very politely be called ambiguous signals to all sorts of people at all sorts of times. We all thought he was kind of one of us, and he'd go to the Euro 
fanatics and say, yes, Britain's going to be the heart of Europe. Then they come along to us and say, no, I'm the most Eurosceptic man in the House of Commons. The first real test of Major's strategy was what deal he could negotiate for Britain in the new European treaty to be agreed in Maastricht. You played an absolutely critical role, I remember this. You were, as it were, the senior Eurosceptic, if I may call you that, in, in, the, in the Cabinet. And as John Major approached the Maastricht negotiations, he, as it were, came to that faction of the Cabinet and asked what it was that he could sign up to with the blessing of the Eurosceptics. And I think you absolutely set out to him two major conditions. Do I remember correctly? Well, tell me what you think the conditions were. Well, that, that we should not enter the single currency and that we should not enter the social chapter. Well, um, I certainly thought that. Um, I was really concerned about the social chapter. But I was really concerned about the single currency too, of course. But I was absolutely determined that we would not sign up to the social chapter. The Prime Minister returns from Maastricht with a deal which he says is right for Britain and Europe. He described the agreement as game, set and match to Britain, after winning concessions on social policy and the single currency. And then, to our collective amazement, we won the 1992 election. I will not be seeking re-election as the leader of the Labour Party. Whatever doubts voters may have had about John Major, they had graver ones about Neil Kinnock. Mrs Thatcher supported her successor in public. Mr Major, you're doing a good job as Prime Minister. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Any hard feelings? Triple A. In private, it was a different matter. Many of the new MPs had entered politics inspired by Margaret Thatcher. They believed that fighting European integration was more important than party unity. Blinded by nostalgia, they coalesced around the former leader. I don't think that the greatest period of her political life was um, uh, those years of John Major's prime ministership when we all know that even if she wasn't egging people on, um, to be disloyal. She never gave um, anything other than the impression that being disloyal to Major, particularly over Europe, was a way of demonstrating one's commitment to herself and her cause. Margaret herself was extremely bitter, and in my biased opinion, because I carried on being a minister in the Major government, she really didn't behave well. Uh, she never came to terms with it, and she encouraged dissent on a, on a grand scale. The dissent focused on John Major's commitment to carry the Maastricht Treaty through Parliament. Mrs Thatcher reminded her admirers of her great negotiating triumphs in Europe, inviting favourable comparison with John Major's unhappy muddle. The party took its eye off the future hypnotised by its past. I think the, um, the sense of um, the lady betrayed gave a certain uh, romance to being a critic of the Maastricht Treaty. I think they thought it was a cause of which they, Margaret identified with, which was somehow taking the party back to what they therefore regarded as its true roots. And it cannot be denied that Margaret was taking quite an active role. Mrs Thatcher's rage against Europe now knew no bounds. And she believed that she'd been duped into agreeing Britain's membership of the European exchange rate mechanism. Eurosceptics like me saw it as a blight on the British economy, which I pointed out to Norman Lamont when he was Chancellor and I was Chief Secretary to the Treasury. I said to you during the summer of 1992 that I thought the ARM was uh, crap, not a very ministerial word, and you, you got very cross with me, you reacted very strongly against that. Well, I may have reacted very strongly, and I'm sure I was right to react very strongly. Um, but I myself, if given a free choice, would not have wanted to join the ERM. I could not in any way display any doubt even to colleagues about it. 
I twice tried to persuade John Major that we should leave the ERM, but I failed to persuade him. I was now in the cabinet for the first time, and within a few months, all hell broke loose. Roger, excuse me. A sterling crisis forced Britain out of the ERM and sent the government reeling. Still, while half the Tory party remember it as Black Wednesday, the other half call it White Wednesday, the day Britain recovered its economic freedom. Well, we did not leave in the morning because the Prime Minister would not agree to do so, and he felt um, I can understand why. He felt this was a huge political event that other members of cabinet should be consulted. And to my horror, he then invited Kenneth Clark and Michael Hesitine all to participate in this uh, decision. The way in which we left the ERM was, of course, a traumatic event. Um, it was a major political catastrophe and I had a front row seat because uh, although I was home... Oh, no, you were on the stage. I was on the stage, yes, yeah, well I was because I was as a home secretary uh, I, I was drawn in because I was invited allegedly to attend a meeting about some other subject uh, and found myself with Michael Heseltine who was brought in the same way actually sitting around the table on the day that the whole grisly thing unfolded and we left the ERM in the worst possible way. And they sat around humming and hawing and saying, well, shall we put interest rates up? Well, of course, it offended me hugely because I felt it was my decision and my recommendation and the recommendation of the governor of the Bank of England was that our membership was over and we should recognise it. Shortly after this trauma, we entered a long, dark tunnel as John Major forced the European Treaty through Parliament. I am not prepared to let it poison the political atmosphere any longer. The whips warned him not even to try, but he'd made a deal in Maastricht and felt duty-bound to push it through in the teeth of sustained rebellion from backbench Thatcherites. The eyes to the right, 301. The nose to the left, 339. Do you think we Eurosceptics behave badly? It depends what you mean by we're Eurosceptics. I meant the ones within the Cabinet. No, I don't think the ones within the Cabinet behaved badly. In fact, I think, on the whole, the ones in the Cabinet behaved well. Well, we like the idea of a free trade area with Europe. There were, there were people outside the Cabinet who, against the backdrop of a set of affairs in which they probably thought we had no chance of winning the 1997 election anyway, were determined to press their point regardless of its consequences on the standing of the Conservative Party. Backbench Tory rebels congregated at the shrine of Lady Thatcher, where they received spiritual sustenance for the struggle against John Major. Quite early on, when quite a number of the new MPs who'd just been elected in 92 had said to me, you know, we came into politics because of her. She is the great leader, she's an inspirational figure, and we've never met her. And I was in regular contact with her, and I said this, and she said, oh, we'll bring them in, you know, of course I'll meet them. And so we organised a, a, a drinks one evening where about sort of 20 of them went round to see her, and inevitably she talked politics, and the thing she felt most strongly about was Europe, and she told them what she thought. But it wasn't designed to try and put pressure on them. Wasn't that a car crash you could see coming? I suppose it was inevitable, but in a sense, I, I wasn't... I wasn't wanting to, to stop it. Um, it seemed to me that they 
respected her, they wanted to hear her views, uh, and she behaved as I knew she would, which was to express her views pretty forcibly. And you really think that was about the, uh, the, the length and the breadth of her intervention? Well, she was certainly seeing a number of people um, at their request. I mean, those who were fighting hardest uh, would go round and talk to her, and she certainly made no secret of her view that um, the treaty should be opposed. But she wasn't sort of actively conspiring in the way that I think some people have tried to suggest. Mm, I think there's a fairly thin line between these well, regular meetings with conspirators and actively conspiring. Well, I mean, it always seemed to me completely unrealistic that a Prime Minister whose reputation was based on the strength of her conviction and the fact that she spoke her mind, and who was then removed against her will from office, should somehow take a vow of silence on an issue which she felt most strongly about. It was all post-1990, post the fall, that she became a quite extraordinarily extreme Eurosceptic and went so far as to encourage, I mean, not, not people like you, but backbenchers who were taking part in the revolt in the House of Commons. And it was, it was all part of this internal civil war. That's how I saw it, and I think quite a lot of people on my side saw it. It's almost like one of those, those ancient wars where everyone's forgotten why they're fighting, but the thrill of fighting or just the habit of fighting is so ingrained, they just carry on doing it. And that, I think, is as good a description as I can manage of the Conservative Party over the European issue. By 1993, a weary and exasperated John Major concluded that Eurosceptics and Thatcherites had morphed into one dishonourable mob of doubtful parentage. Some were inside his cabinet. For reasons that needn't detain us, I was staying in a dingy hotel in Edinburgh where I didn't even have a telephone in my room, and a knock on the door in the morning alerted me to the fact that the Home Secretary was on the telephone downstairs in a, in a, in a public phone box. That was you. And, and you said, I'm ringing to ask you if you've seen the Observer newspaper. And I said, I'm in Scotland, I haven't seen the Observer newspaper. You said, the Prime Minister has called us bastards. <laughs> did you think you were one of them? Well, I, I did. <laughs> he phoned me to assure me that he... <laughs> that I wasn't one. He didn't phone me. <laughs> <laughs> John Major rang you up. Did he think that Thatcherism and Euroscepticism had become the same thing? Well, he didn't have to phone me up to say that. I mean, <laughs> I thought it was. <laughs> they were the same thing. And certainly, when we met periodically um, when I was back in London, um, that would have, I think, been a starting point for, uh, for um, our, any of our discussions on managing the party at the time. Fighting each other had become more important than fighting Labour. A skillful opposition leader could exploit the Tory shambles. In 1994, Labour found exactly the right guy for the job. I was summoned to number 10. I was alone with John Major, when he dropped a bombshell. He told me he'd resign as party leader and then seek re-election. I only had a split second to decide whether to reply, then I shall be a candidate too. But how could a member of the cabinet credibly fight his leader? I heard myself say, good luck, Prime Minister. Once the words were out, there was no way back. I am not prepared to see the party I care for laid out on the rack like this for any longer. To remove this uncertainty, I have this afternoon tendered my resignation as leader of the Conservative Party. John was always ready to feel betrayed by people, and indeed perhaps had, uh, you know, had reasons uh, to be rather like that character in, that was it, carry on Caesar, you know, infamy, infamy, they've all got it infamy. That was what John always felt about life. John Redwood, a prominent Eurosceptic, was the only cabinet member to resign and stand against John Major. I dithered 
and looked politically very clumsy. I've made it perfectly clear that I believe the Prime Minister is going to win the first ballot and that he's going to have my vote. But I have no other comment to make. Thank you very much. But those words sat uncomfortably with the revelation of his supporters' be prepared move in having phones installed for a Portillo campaign headquarters. We needed a change, and I wanted the leadership. But Heseltine has shown that the assassin never gets to wear the crown. I guessed Major would drop out after the first ballot. Installing the telephone lines was a signal that if it went to a second ballot, I would stand. But Major won on the first, so I appeared happy to wound but afraid to strike. A dishonourable position. Major's survival resolved nothing. Sadly for him, sadly for all of us. And Mrs Thatcher couldn't resist the barb of praising Redwood when she congratulated John Major. Prime Minister has won a clear and decisive victory, and I congratulate him most warmly. John Redwood's very respectable vote does justice to his decision to stand. I'd seen Redwood merely as another stalking horse, not a serious contender for Prime Minister. At that time, the best outcome, uh, in my view, would have been had you become leader of the Conservative Party. Um, but I think John Major, the fact that John Major won uh, slightly uh, to my surprise, um, meant that we were inevitably going to go down at the next election. The defeat could have been that much less if John had asserted himself more or if, frankly, he'd left the stage to, you know, to somebody else who could have managed the defeat rather better. As it was, the defeat was catastrophic. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. It's a new life for me, yeah. It's a new dawn, it's a new day. It's a new life for me. Ooh. A new dawn has broken, has it not? Swing, Stephen, Labour Party, 20,500. It's a new day. Tories were slaughtered. My defeat, announced at 2 a.m., was symbolic of the round. My humiliation was later voted the public's third favourite television moment of the 20th century. People gleefully asked each other, were you still up for Portillo? So, right, OK, we lost. So we... <laughs> Go on, John. Mrs Thatcher had hand-picked John Major to continue her political odyssey and it had ended in this meltdown. Typically, it was Margaret Thatcher, not John Major, who called early the next day to commiserate with me on my defeat. She bellowed down the phone, the fight back begins here! But who on earth could lead it? Because I thought, you know, the battle would be very unpleasant between the factions in the party. And also a sense of relief, because I thought, what is the point of leading a party that's only got 165 seats in Parliament and that cannot possibly win the next election? Did, did you not have thoughts like that? I didn't, but I should have had, and I had those thoughts four years later. Um, there had been a widespread expectation that, uh, that you would be the next leader of the Conservative Party, and, a, and a, a considerable expectation on my part that I would have supported you for that, actually. And so it was when so many colleagues were being cut down that night uh, you and many others, actually, we lost a third of the cabinet. But as the hours went by, uh, I began to think, well, quite a bit of responsibility might end up on my shoulders here, and quite a few people started to sidle around the rooms in 
Conservative central office saying... In the middle of that very night. In the middle of that night saying, we're outright, you, the funding is there for you to run for the leadership, it's your duty to do it, uh, and so on. And I was undecided about whether I would do that. Uh, there was enough going on, really, without you know, the entire masonry of 18 years of Conservative government was crashing around our ears. Uh, it, it isn't necessarily your first thought, uh, but, it, but it gets in there. Six candidates, including William, John Redwood, Michael Howard and Ken Clark, went into round one of the contest. Margaret Thatcher held her fire. I support the party and I shall support whoever wins. The eventual runoff was between Ken Clark and William Haig. Margaret Thatcher couldn't bear Euro enthusiast Ken Clark to win. I'm mad about the boy. So she gave her blessing to William. And I know it's. I am supporting William Hay. Now, have you got the name? <laughs> William Hay. Vote for I'm William so Hay. The principal government, following the same kind of the government which I led, nice and I'm vote for him mad. on Thursday. About the boy. Yes, it was helpful. It was helpful in the actual election, uh, because, of course, uh, there were some MPs who were strongly influenced uh, by her. Seven, seven years after she ceased to be Prime Minister, she still had that influence. Yes, and I don't think that should be uh, surprising, actually, because um, she is the... Um, she must still be ranked as the, the greatest peacetime Prime Minister of modern times. Um, and most of us who come into Conservative politics, I think including both of us, had come in under her wing and inspiration, really, and partly because of what she was doing to the country. So, of course, she, rem she remained a very, very influential figure. Um, uh, however, her support, which I always found helpful privately, I always found you could ring her up and get some some very clear uh, advice. Not one of those people who you ring up and she says, well, on the one hand and on the other hand, and why don't you think about it in this, uh, there are all these countervailing factors. You, you phone her up and she says, this is what you do, it's obvious. Ken Clark teamed up with arch Eurosceptic John Redwood. It was the unlikeliest alliance since Captain Kirk teamed up with Mr Spock. I expect a former shadow cabinet with Eurosceptics, prominent Eurosceptics playing a proper role in it, that is the only way to proceed. It was an easy target for Margaret Thatcher, and a little vigorous campaigning helped expose its implausibility. If you remember, one of the more bizarre episodes in my political career was the Redwood-Clark Pact, when uh, John Redwood's followers had the balance of votes to decide it. Uh, this caused panic, if you recall, amongst the Eurosceptics. Sort of Redwood was regarded as having made a great betrayal. Uh, and Margaret went charging around. She saw all John Redwood's voters busily telling them to vote against Ken Clark. William Haig won the leadership convincingly and promised immediately to make a fresh start, to change and renew the party. That was definitely not why Margaret Thatcher had endorsed him. Lady Thatcher, a new start? A what? A new start. A new start? Well, what was wrong with the old one? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't do too badly in my time. I so before William even began modernising the party, Margaret Thatcher tugged him by the collar. In her view, Major failed because he wasn't sufficiently Thatcherite. And it wasn't to happen again. And when William tried to go his own way, he brought ridicule on himself. Clearly, people found that um, this was not a believable thing about the Conservative Party. Uh, you know, the leader who went to the Notting Hill Carnival wasn't believable that the Conservative Party was uh, open uh, to all the people in ethnic minorities. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that, it, that we were genuinely young. There must be something uh, phony about this. There must be some pretense uh, about this. And so that did make it quite hard to try to carry on with a with a change uh, message. Since the electorate had given me a sabbatical from politics, I had leisure to reflect. 
I was shaken by the public's obvious delight at booting me out. Evidently, I personified the arrogance that they disliked in the Tories. I believe that the party needed to change radically and to accept the social changes that it had resisted, especially sexual, racial and cultural equality. In a moment of naive candour, I mentioned that I had had gay experiences in my youth. Big mistake. Huge. A by-election was called right at that moment, and luckily it was in the Tories' safest, most metropolitan and Lucia's seat, Kensington and Chelsea. Suddenly, I was back in Parliament. No sooner had I arrived at Westminster than speculation began about my ambitions to take the leadership from William. Some people believe that today you've just appointed your successor as Tory leader. <laughs> I've appointed some extremely talented shadow ministers, and one of them is here, Shadow Chancellor. And Archie Norman too. William gave me the job of shadowing Gordon Brown. But the really difficult challenge, and the one that split the shadow cabinet, was the battle to change the party. I want to tell the House today that the... Listen, and I want to tell this House that the next Conservative government will not repeal the national minimum wage. And now I want the... And now... Around you, when you got back into the House, there was obviously a rival group inside the cabinet bitterly arguing, busily arguing, for a... A, a, a modernising agenda. It was a phenomenally difficult time to deliver change uh, in the Conservative Party, and on, on the whole, I think that if we had persisted in every, uh, every form of possible change that we could have uh, set about, we would have risked uh, losing a large part of the party. And part of my job in the 1997-2001 uh, Parliament was at least to keep the Conservative Party together and alive and functioning to fight another day. Well, um, so we'll start with the... Uh, what's in the press, Nick? Romander. My time in William's shadow cabinet was my only well, unhappy experience the, uh, in politics. Well, As the general election approached, he shifted the party not to the centre, but to the right, America, arguably to the right of Margaret Thatcher. Of one term. When it became obvious we weren't going to win the election, they kind of panicked and decided we better, I think, isn't the phrase, we better start blowing the dog whistles and get the core vote back and limit, limit the damage once they realised they couldn't win and they could never have won. And they actually undid all the good work by going back to all the stuff that got us thrashed. I can't remember whether we were thrashed as big as 1997 or a little bit less, but it was, it was the same complete and utter catastrophe. The party activists yearned for the success they'd enjoyed under Margaret Thatcher. Mistakenly, I believe, they thought they could recover it with policies that were 20 years out of date. Yeah, that's it, that's that's well, was the only leader of the Conservative Party since the war that gave her name to an ism. There was no Churchillism or Macmillanism. Um, she gave the party an ism, and all those who joined in the 15 years she was leader people who were young men and women in the 70s who became MPs and ministers in the government and all the activists, large numbers of them thought this was the Conservative Party. So when the ism was deposed, they didn't know what ism to go for and they hung on to the Thatcherism. By the time we came to the 2001 election, uh, there were the adverts, you know, of me with Margaret Thatcher's hairstyle, of them saying, really, the Tories haven't changed, they are still the Thatcherites. Uh, and I suppose the net effect of that was damaging to us. Uh, there was a feeling that if the Conservatives were still dominated by Margaret Thatcher, they were living in the past. Keep control of the British economy and British jobs. I think what was damaging um, was the idea, which the Labour Party obviously promoted, that somehow he was a puppet and that she was still pulling strings. What is about? There's something evolving. Very well 
It's a rare thing to see a politician put a hand, his hand in his pocket and pull out a pound. It will never happen if Tony Blair wins the next election because he wants to abolish the pound. I say we can keep the pound. But it's all just a little bit of history repeating. I was as much of a Eurosceptic as I have ever been, but I thought fighting on the issue of how many days to save the pound was absurd. I do regard it as one of the quaintest election campaigns I have ever seen. Maybe one of those. Keep the pound. We had to be able to blow the trumpet. We had to be able to show the Conservative Party did stand for certain things, and we had to have some things on which to fight an election. As simple as that. Um, and also, I suppose, I was going with some of my own instincts on, on those um, subjects. So there was, there was undoubtedly a tension, as you will remember, uh, in the uh, senior reaches of the shadow cabinet. But I think once you arrive at the election, you have to fight with the tools that you've got. I mean, the, the debates that you and I had, the disagreements that you and I had, were whether you could get the party to be heard on the new subjects like health and education, if at the same time you're still talking about, as it were, the old subjects, Mm. immigration, Europe, taxation. I think in retrospect you were right in many of the things you said at the time, that we had to stop talking about other things to get any attention for certain subjects. But the huge risk at that time of stopping talking about those things, the traditional subjects, was that the Conservatives would have gone even further down. You know, the 2001 result could have been worse, even worse, than it was. Labour wins an historic second term in office with a massive majority. William Hague resigns, saying it's vital for leaders to listen and parties to change. I believe it's vital that the party be given the chance to choose a leader who can build on my work, but also take new initiatives and hopefully command a larger personal following in the country. And I've therefore decided to step down as leader of the Conservative Party. I think the sadness for the Conservative Party is that William Hague was sort of put in, it was rather like opening a, a very good wine several years before it should be drunk and you don't get the best of it. Why say that you're going to do that? You know, he gets all the downside of um, saying he's on that side. It's a tribute to William's decency that he agreed to this interview. It's the first time we've spoken since our bruising time together in the Shadow Cabinet, disagreeing hotly about how to change the party. Michael Portillo has declared his intention to stand for the Conservative Party leadership. Announcing his decision, the Shadow Chancellor said the party had suffered a catastrophic election result. We need to adopt a tone which is moderate and understanding. I started as the front runner and led in the first two ballots of MPs. Once upon a time, I'd have had Margaret Thatcher's support. Now she simply assured me that she'd back no one against me. But too many MPs disliked me and or my uncompromising agenda for modernization. One offered me his vote if I'd water down my plans for change. I refused and lost by one vote. Then Ian Duncan Smith, who'd been consistently disloyal to John Major, was endorsed by Margaret Thatcher. He was up against Ken Clark, who had the backing of John Major. I therefore declare that Ian Duncan Smith has been duly elected as leader of the Conservative Party. When Ian Duncan Smith was chosen, I imagined that the party would lurch still further to the right. I felt I had no future in the Commons. I think that uh, an election defeat, on the, because, partly because we were too right-wing, though we'd, though we'd never have won in 2001, let's be honest, um, was almost inevitably followed by the choice um, of a leader who was going to take us <laughs> to exactly the same destination. And it's, it's sad that uh, people who were... Uh, um, either more capable um, and more experienced, like Kenneth Clark, or more glamorous, as, as well as um, capable, um, didn't actually get the job.
Although Ian Duncan Smith was a Eurosceptic Thatcherite, faced by the reality of office, even he saw the need to broaden the party's appeal. Do not underestimate the determination of a quiet man. I resigned from the Conservative Party when Ian Duncan Smith, probably the most lamentable choice for political leader of any party in living memory, became leader. The Parliamentary Party has spoken, the announcement has been made, and I will stand down as leader uh, when a successor has finally been chosen. I will give that leader my absolute loyalty and support. There was no question of my seeking the leadership, because by then I'd pretty much withdrawn from politics. Sadly, the party was still riven by division. Michael Howard became our leader unopposed. He had a reputation for being a creature of the right, if not of the night. But I hoped he might be more liberal than he seemed and lead the Conservatives to the centre ground. Yes. Um, and I, I, did, I did try to follow uh, that prescription. Um, you, you thought modernisation was the right way to go? I was... I was ambivalent about it, to be absolutely honest. I, I could see the force of the argument. I, I was very reluctant not to talk about things which I thought were very important to people. Um, I didn't stop talking about Europe or crime or immigration, and I think if I had, people would have realised I wasn't being true to myself. 2001, the, the party essentially presents itself on Europe, immigration, tax. And loses badly. And loses badly. 2005, it presents itself on Europe, immigration and tax and loses badly. I mean, some, some people might say a goldfish learns more quickly. I think that um, it was uh, extraordinary to say, because we've been beaten so badly, we must offer the electorate exactly what we were beaten badly for offering last time. Tony Blair takes Labour into new territory, a third successive term in government. After his final election campaign... As if anything proved election, that the Tories now had to get the message about change, this was it. I've said that if people don't deliver, they go. And for me, deliver... When you ceased to be leader, you launched David Cameron. Uh, what did you think he was going to be? a very successful leader of the Conservative Party and hopefully you, a very successful Prime Minister. Did you think he was going to be, in many ways, very different from you? Yes. Because it struck me that you were kind of recommending almost your antithesis. Well, I think I'd, I'd, um, I'd tested the alternative theory to destruction in the 2005 election. So but, what, what, was the alternative, lost. what was the alternative theory that had been tested to destruction and what is the alternative to that? The... the I didn't think that that um, I could that, that I was the best person to convince the country that the Conservative Party has changed. So I, I I didn't feel I could really be true to myself and and present an appeal to the country based on the fact that the Conservative Party has changed. And you reached the view that change was the message. Yes. David Cameron was the dark horse contender in the 2005 leadership contest. This time, there was no sign of Mrs Thatcher, who had withdrawn from public life. Though I liked David Cameron, I thought him too new to Parliament to have a hope of winning. But I admired his message of unequivocal commitment to change. Real change isn't just about policies or presentation or organisation or even, dare I say it, having a young, vigorous, energetic leader. Although, <laughs> come to think of it, it's not such a bad idea. 
I had the great advantage in the leadership election of being not exactly the front runner. And so I felt very able to just be bold and say, look, we've got to change to win. Here are the changes we ought to make. And, you know, not really flinching away from some of the difficult things that needed to be said. And I think actually that resonated with people because I was the one making the really clear argument about change, um, whereas the other candidates I don't think were. The Tories jumped a generation in choosing Cameron. He represented a break with the party's past. There remained self-proclaimed Thatcherites, suspicious of his dangerous centrist tendencies. When some people who were very close to Margaret Thatcher criticised me, I always say, well, look at Margaret Thatcher. She was the future. She said to Britain at the end of the 70s, you know, our best days are not behind us. It was an absolutely modernising, futuristic message, and, and we need to do the same thing in very different circumstances where a lot of the future changes are about dealing with social problems rather than economic problems, but also understanding a fantastically rapidly changing world. So at least to that extent, your leadership is, is not a reaction against Margaret Thatcher. It's in a way an emulation of Margaret Thatcher because you're trying to be as modern, as astonishing as she was in her day. Well, I, mean, I would say I'm trying to learn the lessons of her success and apply them to today. I mean, I wouldn't cast myself, I mean, you know, she was an incredible leader, achieved great things. I don't, I've, I've had enough of saying I'm the heir to anybody, I can tell you, but, <laughs> um, but, but I, what I'm, I'm trying to learn the, the genuine lessons of what, how the Conservative Party succeeded at the end of the 70s. Leadership skills. Now, Mr Cameron, I can just say it's just arrived here. The party pretty much left Cameron to his own devices for the first 18 months. Traditionalists grumbled that he was paying attention to hoodies rather than the issues that interested core supporters. But while he was ahead in the polls, he could afford to ignore them. When Gordon Brown came into Downing Street, he enjoyed a huge bounce in popularity, and Cameron started to sink. Once more, the Tories began to divide as complaints surfaced about their leader. The Conservative Party is pretty ruthless. You know, if, if they have a leader who is ahead in the polls and looks like being capable of winning a general election, then they will be very happy and will support them. And a lot of David Cameron's problems uh, stem from the fact that our lead was melting away and, indeed, uh, Gordon Brown uh, jumped ahead in the polls. And that was what caused real uh, concern. Gordon Brown exploited the moment by encouraging speculation that he might call a snap election. And the fact that Cameron had put distance between himself and the Thatcherite past gave Gordon Brown an opportunity. A once familiar figure in Downing Street reappeared for a cup of tea. She's still an immensely powerful figure. Um, the mere fact that Gordon Brown thinks it's in his interests to be photographed standing next to her, in a sense, tells you that she still has uh, a great position uh, in the public mind. A fourth Tory election defeat would have triggered another round of vicious recrimination and finished Cameron's leadership. But Brown blinked. So it might be a bit messy. I recognise an October the 4th election would have been a very tough ask for, the, for me and the Conservative Party to get out there and say, really change people's mind and say, look, this really is a continuation of the last 10 years. It's not a new government. We would have, it would have been a very tough fight. If you were to lose the election, for example, do you not think the party would break up between those who said there'd been too little modernisation and those who said there'd been too much? There are certain questions, starting with if, that I never answer, and that's one of them. <laughs> the Tories owed almost everything to Margaret Thatcher for being in power for 18 years, and much to people like me for being loathed at the end of it. Margaret Thatcher has cast a long shadow. Nostalgia for her success has trapped the party in the past. David Cameron is the first leader explicitly to map a new direction, aware that if he falters, he'll get the chop, as did his predecessors. Like Tony Blair, he's modernising his party without sentimentality. He needs to borrow from Margaret Thatcher as well and inspire a new generation of young voters, as 30 years ago, she inspired me. tonight, find out what it's like to be the one sitting opposite the Prime Minister when the lower house is in session as Julia Hartley-Brewer uncovers the worst job in politics.